Rabbit Test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You are going to hear a conversation about renting an apartment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. Do you know what kind of apartment you're looking for? I'm thinking of something for my best friend and I. The apartment doesn't have to be too big, just something comfortable for the two of us. I'm looking for a kitchen, two bedrooms and a bathroom. Just something simple. OK, well, let me show you what we have to offer. We divide our apartments into three categories. There are standard apartments, upgraded standard apartments and luxury apartments. Please follow me. This apartment just went up for rent yesterday. The old tenants moved into a larger one. This apartment is what I call the standard apartment. It's small, but has everything you need. The kitchen comes with a refrigerator, an oven and a stove. There is one bathroom with a shower, but no bathtub. The rooms are a good size and both have their own closets. The living room has enough space for a couch. We will provide a television for you. These apartments are very popular with students because they are affordable and practical. Right now, we are renting these out for only $1,000 a month. I think this is a little bit on the small side. There's no space for a dining table or even for an extra desk. We will both need room to study. If there are guests over, we hope to be able to have a dining table big enough for at least four people. Do you have anything slightly larger? Maybe just an apartment with a bigger living room? Well, let's take a look. Right now, we also have an opening for a luxury apartment. This apartment is larger. It has three bedrooms, and all three are larger than the last one. And there are two bathrooms, and all have bathtubs. The kitchen is also larger, and come with an additional dishwasher and freezer. The living space has plenty of space for a dining room. How much is the rent on these apartments? These are more expensive, usually in the $2,500 range. Don't forget that there is an additional bedroom, so you could find another roommate to lower the cost. Hmm, I think that's a little bit on the expensive side. We don't really have the time to find another roommate, so it's probably better to stick with the two bedroom places. Is there anything between these two? Come with me. I can show you this apartment right now, but there are people living in it. There are no more of these kinds of apartments available at this moment, but if you decide that you like it, I can put you on the waiting list, and as soon as we have openings, you will be contacted. Sure, let's take a look. This is the upgraded standard apartment. As you can see, it's larger than the other two-bedroom apartment. There are two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one in each room. The living room comes with a television, but no furniture. The kitchen is around the same size as the other smaller apartment. The basic difference is the additional bathroom and larger living room. These rent for around $1,400. Now look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. Seems like a good deal. Do you know when an apartment like this will be available? That's hard to say. I know these people who live here right now should be graduating soon, so they might be moving out. Well, I guess I'll put my name on the waiting list. Hopefully there'll be an opening as soon as possible. That sounds like a good plan. I will notify you as soon as we have vacancies. You will have to leave us some information and a student identification number. Sure, no problem. My full name is Robert Jack Browning. Could I have your age, please? I'm 38. Your major? I'm studying biology. How about naming some of your hobbies? Hmm, fishing, golf, watching movies and spending time with my family. Sounds like a good life. What is the price range of the apartment you are looking for? Somewhere between $1,000 to $1,500. Your student identification number, please? QS45890. Could you repeat that? QS45890. Lastly, could you leave us a phone number? OK. It's area code 236-580-2287. Thank you very much. I will give you a call as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear the director of the Leadership Council give his welcome address at a convention. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Please find your seats. Snacks will be available all day long. Thank you. Allow me to first introduce myself. I am Joe Steinke, Director of the Leadership Council. On behalf of the Organizing Committee for the 8th Annual Leadership Conference, I welcome you all to San Dimas, California, for a special session on postmodern solutions. We have people attending from as far away as Toronto, New York, and even the Bahamas. Frankly, I wish we had gone to you there. <laughs> but we're very glad you're all here. Let me say further that this will be our largest conference yet. Registrations have far surpassed our expectations. For the first three days, we will be hosting more than 325 participants for lectures and workshops. Another 100 will be joining us for our final two days and culminating session on Friday evening. We also have a larger selection of seminars than ever, a total of 32. Because we know that you all will want to attend a few special sessions, we will repeat key seminars each day. So there will actually be 38 sessions. I'm sure you will all be pleased with the content and the quality of speakers. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, for those who have opted not to take part in our bag lunches, there are a number of places nearby that we can recommend. We are located here in the convention center just across the street from the Harford Shopping Mall, and the place we most recommend is Vital's, which is just west across Queen Street on the opposite corner. Please be careful crossing both streets, however, as we don't want to lose any participants. <laughs> if you're not up to Vital's, you can also get some Italian food at the Olive Garden, which is further down Queen Street and east on Danning Avenue, across from the police station. They have a great minestrone soup and excellent breadsticks, all you can eat. On the other hand, if you want some good old American food, you can head to Fuddruckers for some big hamburgers or to the Cattle Company for some fat, juicy steak. Fuddruckers is next to the Olive Garden, but the Cattle Company is back closer to us in the opposite direction of Vital's. Just go east out of the convention center across King Street. It's on the same side as the convention center, so you just have one street to cross. Enjoy. But also, please make sure you are back for the afternoon sessions. These will always start at 1.30 p.m. That will give you an hour and a half for lunch each day. Sessions will be over each day at 5.30. Now, regarding the schedules we've printed out, there have been a couple of last-minute changes. The session titled New Leadership Strategies will no longer be held in Seminar Room 1, but in the main ballroom. This session has garnered much praise and is highly recommended to all, hence the change to a larger room. Another session has been canceled. That session was titled Leading by Serving, and it was scheduled for Daniel's room. The speaker for that session, Dr. Mark Green, had to return home for some urgent health situation. We wish the best to Dr. Green and that all is fine with his family. Finally, the session titled Using the Arts and Media has been changed to the second lounge room, Lounge 2. Please show up promptly for sessions and sit towards the front of each room so that all seats can be utilized. Also, turn off all pagers, beepers, and cell phones. Drinks and snacks will be provided outside each room, but please be careful at your tables. Enjoy the conference. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a radio program about do-it-yourself house painting. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, Thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. 
That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres, enter this into the calculator along with the type of surface you're painting and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy so washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. 
This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's programme, I'll be giving some advice on... That is the end of Section 2. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art, learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year. As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate Galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions, St. Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station, built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, 
The second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmeor Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, once by floodwaters from the River Thames and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection, and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Yeah. Please tell me that I can't, that I won't, that I fail, that I'll never make it out, yeah. Please tell me all the bad, never good, fill my head.